Um, this talk is a brief romp through the development of the MCM70 personal computer. The MCM70 was announced 50 years ago in 1973 and was first delivered in 1974. So why is the MCM70 significant? Arguably, it was the first personal computer which provided a keyboard, a display, two mass storage devices, a high-level language, all in a package that was small enough that you could easily pick it up and carry it around. For those interested in more details, there's a Wikipedia article about the MCM70. And for even more details, there's a book, Inventing the PC, the MCM Story by Zbigniew Stachniak. I'll give details about that book later on. But first, some context. In 1971, the word computer brought to mind huge mainframe devices that cost millions and took up the space the size of a classroom or larger. The Model 40 pictured here would be one of the smaller mainframes, com mainframe computers. The new small and inexpensive devices were mini computers like this PDP-8, but both small and inexpensive were relative terms. The medium-sized PDP-8 shown here would have cost around $33,971, which works out to around $230,000 today. Computing power was expensive in those days. But none of those early computers were really easy to use. Even the relatively inexpensive PDP-8 involved a lot of arcane commands and knowledge to make use of it. The MCM-70 story starts with a man by the name of Mers Cut, who was a Canadian, who was an entrepreneur and an inventor. In 1971, the hot new personal electronic device was the pocket calculator. Until before, shortly before that time, calculators had been either big, heavy mechanical devices or expensive desktop devices. So at that time, it was remarkable that calculators were becoming available that were small enough to fit in the pocket, well, a fairly big pocket, and priced such that many people could afford them. I bought my first four-function calculator in 1973 for $30 at the time, or about $200 in today's money. In 1970, Murs Cut was at a computer conference where he met and brainstormed with Robert Noyce, a co-founder and first, uh, one of the first and the first CEO of Intel. Bear in mind that at that time, Intel was just a small startup company, nothing like the Intel we know today. Learning that an 8-bit chip, the 8008, was on the way, MERS envisioned taking computers down the same path as calculators, that is, making them small enough, economical enough, and easy enough to use that almost anyone could make use of one. So the 8008 could provide the computing power, but then the problem was how to make it easy to use. Something as complicated as even a PDP-8 would not do. MERS wanted to make his proposed computer as easy to use as a pocket calculator. And now for a bit more context. Ken Iverson, also a Canadian, was born and raised in Alberta and did his undergraduate work in mathematics and physics at Queen's University in Kingston, and then did graduate work on a scholarship at Harvard. To make a very long story short, while at Harvard and later at IBM, Iverson came up with a system of mathematical notation, which was eventually implemented as the computer language APL. That language used a lot of unconventional symbols, but it was powerful. It was concise, and it had a simple and easy to understand syntax. APL was first made available for IBM mainframes in 1968, but it required rather a lot of computer resources. MERS was aware of and a fan of the APL language and thought it would be a good way to put computing power in the hands of many people. But MERS was an entrepreneur, not a programmer, which led him to look for someone who could implement the APL language. MERS was acquainted with Gord Raymer, who, in 1968 and 1969, as the assistant director of the York University Computer Center, had written an implementation of APL, which was light on the use of computer resources. The two of them teamed up, and in late 1971, MERS created Cut Systems Incorporated in Toronto for the purpose of designing, building, and marketing a small APL computer. Subsequently, the name was changed to Microcomputer Machines, which makes rather more sense. 
In, 19, in early 1972, there were three teams at work. There was a hardware team led by Jose Luraya doing development and making prototypes. There was a software team led by Go Gord Raymer working on implementing APL. And MERS was organizing and using a cardboard mock-up to create interest in potential investors. Although MERS and the head office remained in Toronto, both, go both, both Gord Raymer and Jose Luraya resided in Kingston. So that's where most of the development work was done. Initially, the work was done in Jose's basement, but as more staff were recruited, space was rented in a nearby building. Alas, the construction quality of the building was questionable, to put it politely, and it shared a common wall with a large garbage truck repair depot. Up on the second floor, there was a window which opened directly onto the repair depot. If so inclined, you could open the window and enjoy the sound and smell of the garbage trucks. A certain amount of both came through even when the window was closed. Um, and the initial thoughts based on the popularity of the personal calculator were to create a computer that could be made using the case from an existing calculator to save cost. An expanded but still very small keyboard would allow entry of alphanumeric and special symbols with up to five different symbols per key. For the display, a 13 or 15 segment display was considered. To this would be added a cassette tape for mass storage. Today, everyone knows what a personal computer is, and they're everywhere. In 1971, there were no personal computers, and the very idea of a personal computer was new and unexplored. MCM was literally inventing the PC as they went along. The concept was sound, but there were a lot of challenges. Semiconductor memory was expensive. The 2102 RAM chips shown here, 1K by 8, were running around $20 each, and that's in 1971 dollars. For 8K bytes of RAM, that works out to over $1,200 Mind you, at that time, 4K words of core memory for a PDP-8, equivalent to 6K bytes, was around $2,500 What could be used for a display? Segmented displays could represent numbers and, somewhat awkwardly, uh, letters but they couldn't reasonably represent all the special symbols needed for APL. CRT's displays existed, but they were big, heavy, and expensive. How would a cassette tape be used for storage? DEC had been using tapes for some years, but each reel of tape, and you needed two, was four inches across, the drive was the size of a microwave oven, weighed 60 pounds, and cost around $3,000. Consumer audio cassette tapes were available, but how could you reasonably make use of one to store digital data? And then there was the question of the language. Would the 68, would the 8008 processor be powerful enough to support the APL language, which up to this point had run only on mainframe computers? Clearly, this was an interesting but hardly risk-free venture. Some initial work was done with a SIM 8 development board from Intel, which demonstrated that the 8008 actually worked and could be used to do useful things. The photo shows the SIM8 board at the top, while the rest of the device was fabricated by MC the MCM hardware group. But while suitable for development, the SIM8 wasn't suitable for making a small portable computer. Jose and the hardware team came up with their own design, with a proof of concept version being built on a tabletop rack. This became known as the rack machine, and I'll have a few things to say about the rack machine a little later. The memory layout of the, eight, of the MCM-70 is interesting. The 8008 can only address 16K bytes. 8K was to be used for RAM for the user program and data. That only left 8K for an APL interpreter, which clearly wasn't enough. The solution was bank switching. The lowest 6K was dedicated to commonly used routines. The next 2K consisted of 16 banks of 2K each, only one of which could be active at a time and the high 8K of RAM was for the user's workspace. Thus, there was 38K of space available for the APL interpreter, which was enough. And the APL interpreter, of course, was all in ROM. Um, for a display, they settled on a Burroughs self-scan, which was a plasma display, think little neon orange, orange dots, that was seven pixels high by 222 pixels wide, capable of displaying 32 characters. 
And there you have what a self-scan looks like displaying its MCM APL. The self-scan contained no character generator and no RAM of its own. Rather, it was bitmapped into 222 bytes of RAM so you could display any characters you liked on it. Getting this working, mind you, was a bit of an exercise in itself, as in effect, you had to implement DNA on a CPU that had no idea what DMA was. Initial development of software was started even before they had an 8008 machine. All this initial development was done, of course, in Assembler. In order to be able to assemble code for the 8008, they used an IBM 360 at the University of Ottawa via a remote job entry terminal at St. Lawrence College in Kingston. Macros were written for the 360 assembler, which allowed it to act as a cross assembler. You fed an 8008 source code and it would in turn generate 8008 object code. But there was a problem. As was usual at the time, programs for the 360 were written on punched cards. So the MCM programmers coded their 8008 programs on punched cards, fed them into the cross assembler, and got object code printed in hexadecimal. But then what? How to get the object code into the rack machine at MCM? The rack machine at MCM had a card reader attached to it, but there was no card punch at the St. Lawrence College RJE terminal. The solution was to have key punch operators manually punch cards with the object code, which then could be taken back to MCM and loaded into the machine. It was clunky and awkward, but it worked. There was no, no internet and no thumb drives back in those days. Given that St. Lawrence College was a 10 minute drive from MCM, doing a new assembly wasn't something you did casually. Instead, there was patching. Once your program was loaded into the rack machine, you could work on it with the aid of a debugger. The debugger was a program which lets you set breakpoints, start execution, even trace instructions one at, a, in one at a time. When you found a fault in your program using the debugger, you could put in a patch manually. We all got pretty good at writing machine instructions in hex while carefully noting what you did uh, so you could correct the source code later. After a lot of patching, things would start to get confusing, at which point you had to bite the bullet and run an assembly. For mass storage, the choice was an MFE 250 digital tape drive, which used cassette tapes similar to audio cassette tapes. These drives were specifically used for digital storage, mind you. They were not just consumer audio drives pressed into service to store digital data. The tapes used for the MCM were not sequential tapes. Rather, they consisted of individual blocks, each of which could be rewritten without affecting other blocks. Conceptually, they were similar to deck tapes, which were also block-oriented. In effect, they worked like a very slow disk and then in that each block could be read and written as needed. The MCM-70 had 8K for user workspace, but even at that time, this was considered small compared to the 32K workspace provided by mainframe APLs. The solution to this was AVS, a virtual system, which was a virtual memory system implemented by Andre Arpan, one of the MCM programmers. Using AVS was optional, but when it was turned on, any data or function that wasn't currently in use could be swapped out to tape to make rooms for, room for things that were being used. It wasn't fast, but it worked, and it allowed users to do things that would not have been possible without it. By, by mid-1973, MCM had some demo units, pretty basic machines that could run a subset of APL, which they would demonstrate to interested people. But these early machines tended to overheat, so there'd be a bit of demonstration, then some talking to give the machine a chance to cool down enough for the next bit of demonstration. Note that this machine has no tape drives. They were not ready yet. And this was a demo machine just to show what it could do useful things. It wasn't a full usable machine. Um, I joined MCM in 1973, and my first job was to take over development of an assembler so that they could assemble programs in-house rather than going through the clunky process of driving to St. Lawrence College. The assembler, as I received it, consisted of about 1,500 punch cards containing not a single comment. It was remarkably bare bones, and it worked in the sense that if you fed correct source code to it, then it would generate correct object code. But if there were errors in your source code, it would either crash or, more commonly, silently produce incorrect object code. 
Because the existing code base had been developed using an IBM 360 assembler, the in-house assembler of necessity had a lot of IBM-centric characteristics. Over time, that assembler became a competent piece of work which was regularly used by the programmers at MCM. And later it was used as the basis of assemblers for the Z80, the Z8000, and the Intel 8086. The photo is of a much younger me taken around 1976 with the original rack machine to my left. One of the special features of the rack machine, a feature that did not exist in the production MCM 70s was the debug latch. The 8008 is an interesting CPU that when looked at from today, lacks a lot of features. <clears throat> but at the time, people were amazed that you could have an entire processor on a single chip. The missing features weren't such a big deal. The program used for debugging needed to be able to set breakpoints so you could get control when you reached a particular place in your code. In order to be able to continue executing, the debug program needed to be able to save and restore the state of the machine. But the 8008 by itself is incapable of saving its own state, a missing feature. In order to save data to RAM, you have to load the address of RAM into a register, thus destroying the contents of that register. So the debug latch was a hardware latch accessed via an IO instruction where you can save the contents of the register and then carry on with the business of saving the rest of the machine state. One of the main goals of the MCM-70 was ease of use, and it achieved that goal. Many computers of the day were complicated to get going, involving hand-toggled loaders and arcane instructions. With the MCM-70, you just pressed the start key and the machine was ready to go. Everything was built in. All the commands to access the mass storage and everything else the machine could do was at your fingertips the moment you turned it on. And interestingly, there was no off switch. There was a command to do that, so you couldn't turn it off by accident while it was in mid-computation. But you could write a long-running program which would turn the machine off when it was done, perhaps in the middle of the night. It even had something like what we would know today as suspend to disk. If you issued a particular command, or if the power failed, then the state of the machine and the current workspace was saved to tape, and then the machine shut off. If you press start while a tape with a saved workspace was in it, then the drive would read in the, the drive would read in the tape, computation would continue from where you left off. This magic was accomplished with a built-in battery, roughly equivalent to six D cells, and an advanced power supply. All this in the computer that was available in 19 for purchase in 1974. Speaking of the power supply, in fact, the power supply was so advanced that it just about sank the entire MCM-70 project. Most power supplies at that time were linear, simple, big, heavy, and not very efficient. The power supply, for example, for a PDP-8 weighed about 50 pounds and occupied the space equivalent to that of a briefcase. The MCM-70 power supply was a couple of pounds and about the size of two pounds of butter but it used switching technology, which at the time was cutting edge. When it worked, it was wonderful, but getting it to work reliably in production was a major headache that took a lot of time to resolve. The MCM-770 was delivered, first delivered in 1974. An improved version called the MCM-700 was introduced in 1975, along with a dual floppy disk drive. Because both tapes and floppies are block oriented, from the user's perspective, accessing the disk was exactly the same as accessing the tape, just way faster. The 8008 is not a fast processor. A high level language like APL running on an 8, 8008 meant that the MCM was uh, not blazingly fast. It was still a useful machine for many applications though. For example, an MCM-70 was used to run a simulation for the Ontario Hydro Nuclear Generating Station at Pickering. Prior to acquiring the MCM-70, those calculations had been done using an IP-sharp APL timesharing service, which was very expensive. The MCM-70 didn't do the calculations quickly, but it did do them, and once purchased, you could run it all day and all night without any increase in cost, so it paid for itself pretty quickly. When I joined MCM, I was a very junior programmer whose main job was to maintain the programs, like the assembler, used by the programmers who were writing the APL code that went into the MCM-70. 
None of my code went into the APL ROMs of the MCM70. But some code of mine was used by MCM customers was TEX700, an early word processing package. While I wrote the code for the TEX70, I can't claim credit for the idea. That credit belongs to my wife, who at the time worked as a secretary in a legal office. Many documents that had to be typed consisted mostly of standard boilerplate text with some odd name, address, or dates that varied by document. Seeing that the MCM70, working with a Diablo high-type daisy wheel printer, uh, could produce typewriter quality output, she asked if the MCM70 couldn't store and print text. Having never seen a word processor before, I was rather making it up as I went along, but in fact it worked and was useful as she had intended. Tech 70 was written in assembler, not APL, and it used sequential tapes rather than the uh, block-oriented tapes to store data. But back to the rack machine. I did a lot of work on the rack machine back in the day. Early this year, it occurred to me that I could build a recreation of the rack machine, and it would be like having an old friend back. So I got a couple of 8,008 chips that have come up from time to time on eBay, and then spent about eight months of part-time effort working my way through the process of designing, testing, and building such a machine. It's not meant to look like the rack machine, but it's meant to have an 8,008 CPU and work like the rack machine. Here's a photo of the breadboard version. It's somewhat remarkable that that thing worked at all, but it did. And here's a photo of the printed circuit board version. It duplicates most of the capabilities of the original MCM rack machine. It can drive an actual self-scan display. It's pin compatible with the MCM70 keyboard. It has an Omniport for connection to Omniport peripherals. It runs MCM APL, and it's got a lot of RAM for development work. I've yet to get tape drives going, but all in good time. Uh, thanks to the massive amount of work on the part of Zbigniew Stachniak, the fellow that wrote the book about the development of the MCM-70, there is now a permanent exhibit about MCM and the MCM computers it developed at the Stacy Science and Engineering Library at York University, pictured here. The device way on the left-hand side is that original SIM-8 SIM uh, board and other associated stuff, which sat down in my basement for 30 years before finding a place of honor there. Uh, all right, that's the end of the presentation, showing our details about the book. And if there's any way to take questions, I would be happy to take questions at this point. Any questions, folks? So let me say again, um, the display has been set up at the Stacy Science Library, York University. Uh, Josh Bedinson, oh, Josh, has uh, worked in uh, helping with the restoration. Um, definitely worth checking out. Uh, Actually, we have one question. Go ahead. I do have um, one question. Is, uh, I'm the first time I've heard about this computer, and uh, it's really fascinating the story. Um, I'm wondering about um, the pervasiveness of the deployment of the computer. Who were the the main users of, of the computer? Was it universities, colleges? Uh, you mentioned uh, Ontario Hydro. Uh, who, who would be the main sort of client base of these computers? Um, the main people that used it were people that were had been using time-sharing services to, to run APL for the most part, because those time-sharing services worked well, but they were expensive. Um, uh, I know there it was, it was a fair wide, wide range of people that used it, but certainly actuaries often found it useful because APL is great for doing numerical calculations. So it found... Um, use there. I know there were people, there were travel agencies that used it on occasions for things. So it was a, it was a fairly wide range of people that used it. And, and partly because I was in the, the software side of it, not the marketing side of it, I wasn't terribly aware of that as well, if that makes any sense. Another question. Um, I, you hear a lot of lore about uh, different uh, mainframes and different computer systems, that there's a uh, kind of uh, after hours uh, creation of little games and things like that. Did that happen at all with the MCM or it was strictly business? Uh... No, M MCM was a really fun place to work at because it, the, at, the whole atmosphere was very casual. 
Um, as long as you did the job you were supposed to do, there, you didn't catch any flack. And in fact, that Text 70 program that I mentioned wasn't even an official project of MCM. I mentioned that it was the gen genesis of it was when my wife talked about it. I wrote that in my spare time. And eventually, uh, once it was up and running, showed it to Gord Raymer uh, and said, hey, you know, hey, Gord, take a look at this. And realizing that it was, you know, a potentially useful program, it became an actual product. But that was just something I started in my spare time while working there. There was various, sure, there was stuff that went on after hours there. Uh, I remember Byte came out with a thing about reading barcodes printed on uh, paper, which was, I mean, the people were looking for ways to distribute programs back there. And this is before the internet, before thumb drives, and before any of the stuff that we're used to now. Um, and so I remember one of the fellows and I got together and built a barcode reader from scratch uh, and stuff stuff like that, but but not nothing terribly dramatic. Great, thanks. Any more questions? Stephen had one. Yeah, I had one. I just I'm walking back and forth at home here, and I just happened to uh, catch this uh, the scene of your uh, uh, prototype uh, board. My question is pretty simple: is How did you maintain sanity on trying to manage all of those single color wires across <laughs> everything? <laughs> well. It you, I didn't sit down and build the whole thing from scratch, if you know what I mean. It was built a, a chunk at a time. So first, you know, I built the clock circuit and got that working. And then you built the, the CPU. The, the 8008 is not really a CPU. It's about three quarters of a CPU because it, it, it needs a handful of support chips just to make it go at all. Mm -hmm. um, so the next step was to get the CPU going. And I, I hooked the CPU up to what I called trivial memory which was just a latch that every time the the CPU called for an instruction, it, the latch said C0, which is a no-op in 8008 language. So it would just sit there executing no-op after no-op after no-op um, and running through, you know, it, it's 14K of memory. But that demonstrated that the that the CPU section actually worked. And then, you know, I got got uh, very simple memory working. Then real the real actual memory layout is pretty complex in there because there's four modes it can work in depending on who's RAM and who's, who's ROM, who's RAM, and the fact that the self-scan is sitting there in the background accessing memory um, thousands of times a second. Um, but basically, I built it in chunks and got each chunk working and then moved on to the rest. So it wasn't, it wasn't all that difficult. Impressive work, nonetheless, for sure. Well, it's not it something might... I could tolerate for myself. Well, it was done a little bit at a time. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> I know. I realize it. Was, I, I think you mentioned it was uh, over a course of eight months. Like, I understand that. It's just, even just, I, I don't think I could sit there for eight months and work on one specific thing kind of deal. Like, I'm, I'm listening to this. I'm also trying to clean up a desk here at home and to, to uh, put a fan on another computer, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm all over the place. I, I just, I envy the, uh, your endurance on trying to get this or getting it completed. It's good. Well, thank, thank you very much. I, I was even happier once I got it to a printed circuit board because that, that proto board thing was incredibly fragile, you know, it oh, yeah. seized the wrong way. It, it, you know, you knock one wire out and it was, it was gone. But once you went to a printed circuit board, it at least works reliably. Yep. Thanks. No problem. Any more, Any more questions? questions? Okay, I think that's everything. I'm just gonna. <laughs> and we'll be posting this to YouTube at some point in the near future. Um, I'll send you a link when we do so. So once we upload the link, well, uh, once we upload the video, we, I'll send you a link. Okay, no, that sounds good. Excellent. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, sir. And you're welcome to join us for other talks, of course. Okay, well, yeah, I've got, got other things i got to do today, but but thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> no, no, sir. So next talk is at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, okay, thank you, and take care. Mm -hmm.